Thank you very much, Gerald. It's an honor to uh, be here uh, talking to a group like this. Uh, I, congratulations to all the organizers uh, for putting this together. Um, I, I want to talk to you, begin by talking to you tonight about a theory that is very popular um, in the Silicon Valley of California. Um, it's a theory that many of our leading thinkers in technolog technological matters have advanced. It is called the theory of singularity, and it says this, that as machines become more complex and more intelligent, they will eventually reach a point at which they are so complex and intelligent that they will be smarter than human beings. At that point, we will not be able to govern the machines any longer. The machines will govern us. In California, we've already achieved a dubious kind of singularity. Our system of government, particularly the pieces that involve the budget, taxation, and money, has become so complicated that we citizens and those we elect can no longer effectively government, govern it. And this state of affairs is our own fault. The complex governing system has been authored not just by parties, not just by interest groups, not just by the legislative bodies, but by the people themselves over a century using their power under our state's direct democracy to impose whatever laws or constitutional amendments they wish. Hundreds of constitutional amendments and initiatives with spending mandates and tax limits have combined in a way unintended by any of us into a machine beyond our control. Life in such a place is full of paradoxes. To take just one, our Constitution requires a balanced budget. But all the rules of our Constitution make a balanced budget impossible. So in California, what is constitutionally required is also constitutionally prohibited. Californians have spent much of my adult life attempting to fix this machine we've created. We even elected as our governor a movie star famous for playing a machine who can destroy other machines. None of it has worked. There are many lessons in California for the rest of the world. The simplest is don't design systems of direct democracy that look like California's. Ours is the most inflexible on the planet. We don't leave room for the fixing of errors or compromise on the front end of our process and we make it next to impossible for the legislature to alter initiatives once they have been passed. And we do everything, everything in a great hurry. As the people in this room know, the best direct democratic systems are carefully and responsibly integrated with representative democracy. I hope California will redesign its system along those lines someday. But there is a trickier, harder lesson for all of us in California's failures. It has to do with the truth apparent to anyone who has watched American television and seen all the advertisements for Viagra and other pharmaceuticals that supposedly help men with the delicate problem of erectile dysfunction. And that lesson is size matters. But size doesn't matter in the same way that those TV advertisements mean. Being big is, yes, useful for some things, but it is a terrible problem for democracy. And Californians are not Dr. Frankensteins. We didn't set out to build a governing monster. We tried to build a democracy but didn't account for our own size and rapid growth. The 120-person legislature that we adopted in 1879 gave Californians close connections to their elected representatives then, because we had fewer than one million people in, 1819, in 1879. That same 120-person legislature now represents nearly 38 million people. And your chances of, winning a, of cashing a winning ticket in our state lottery, and the lottery itself is a creation of our direct democracy, are better than your chances of meeting your elected representative. <laughs> Our direct democracy has suffered from the same failure to adjust for scale. The initiative referendum and recall rules that fit us in 1911, our direct democracy will be a century old in October, no longer fit us today. Our signature standards based on a percentage of voters now require more than a million signatures practically um, because so many signatures are turned out to not be uh, not verified. And, and that requires millions of dollars. Communicating with voters requires tens of millions, in some cases, in cash. And so we've turned our petition circulation and signature gathering and ballot initiative and referendum campaigns into these machines, machines of money and media and technology that broadcast messages to millions. Most initiative campaigns barely bother anymore with human-to-human -human contact. Even phone calls to voters are made not by humans, but by computers who play tape messages often into our voice mailboxes. 
This tendency for direct democracy to be mechanized is not a problem just for the state of California, but for any large polity, whether it's a big city or fast-growing province or prefecture, and it is an inescapable and large danger for anyone daring enough to build an initiative process, for example, for a continent of 500 million people. The momentum for mechanization and bigness is natural, and the temptation to build big democratic systems is huge. After all, isn't power big? And the world's most powerful governments and multinational institutions and multinational corporations are big. So why not a big, direct, democratic machine for the people the wheel? I've come a long way from the biggest state in a very big country to issue a warning to you all, which is size may be your friend in the bedroom, but size is the enemy of good citizenship. Yes, yes, we must challenge the Goliaths of the globe, but we also should be sure that the rocks we seek to hurl at the bad guys aren't too big for our own slingshots. Now, the people in this room come from all over the world. They have different backgrounds and very different views. Direct democracy activists often are, I, I dare say, argumentative, sometimes difficult. So it is a hard thing to get everyone to agree on what we have in common. But still we must ask, what is our shared mission here? What are our shared values? Now, well, since I'm an American, and, and since I have an obligation to uphold my country's reputation for arrogance, let me just come right out and tell you what our shared vision and mission ought to be. And that's this, to build a direct democracy around the world that no matter the size of the place where it exists, operates on a profoundly and deeply human scale. I propose that that be the test of every democratic institution we build. Does each direct democracy system encourage human-to-human -human interaction? Are its rules simple and easy to understand so that everyone may access it? Does it promote conversation? Does it force us to talk and bargain and compromise on a personal level? Does it bring us together? If the answer to these questions is no, then the direct democratic system in question must be sent back to the machine factory for redesign. Because a direct democracy that doesn't exist on this human scale isn't merely a problem or an inconvenience. We know from history, we know from California, that direct democratic machines are dangerous, not least to democracy itself. Now this is a room full of people who make big plans in their heads, and that's fine. But big thinkers must be careful. We must remind ourselves constantly of what we know to be know in our hearts, that the most beautiful things in life, be they a place, a moment, or a child, are often small. We, must, we meet here tonight as a small group in a world that is too big. And it's precisely because we are a small coalition, coalition that we are actually powerful. And so let us help the world do what it is we are doing here in Belgium. Let us talk and share and exchange and compromise and work, one human interaction at a time, to make this planet a more prosperous, more peaceful, more democratic place. Because if we don't, the machines may win. Thank you very much.